Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD, tonight. Um, this is a webinar where we talk about Lyme disease, and uh, every week is a little bit different because you create each webinar with your questions. I'm very interested to see what you have in store for me tonight. Um, it seems that we have uh, no two weeks are ever the same. And usually, sometimes we get into a theme with the question, so I'll have to see what you're um, going to be um, showing to me tonight or what kind of things you want to talk about tonight. During the webinar, I am going to be creating a recording, and that sometime uh, tomorrow, I think tomorrow is probably going to be probably after about uh, 11 to 12 p.m. Um, I have some other things in the morning I have to deal with, but we'll be getting that out to you probably early afternoon tomorrow, so it's going to be a little bit later um, than typical. All right, but that will be coming to you. You're going to get an email from me that will uh, tell you that it is ready and it will contain information about how do you actually view that. Um, so um, if you happen to not get that email, there's a few other places you can find it. You can find it at my uh, uh, online Lyme information site, which is uh, Treat Lyme by Marty Ross MD at treatlyme.net. You can find it on the homepage of my medical supplement store, which is Marty Ross MD supplements at treatlime.com. And then finally, you can find it at my clinic website, which is martyrossmd.com. So there's a few places you can find it if you don't get that email, okay? Let's see here. Oh, during the webinar tonight, I am gonna be posting the questions. And so those that are participating in the live version, it should show on your screen. Um, I do want to let you know in the recorded version, it doesn't show up. So I will be reading those questions. And so that's why I like to read them is so that uh, the people in the recorded version can hear it. The other thing I just want to point out, I think many of you that are, are here and have been here before know, I try to, to um, I ask and request that you actually do these as shorter questions. If they get too long, it becomes very difficult to follow for those that are following when I read it. And then secondly, um, it actually becomes too long and it can jam up my computer screen when I try to go post it. And it actually, on my side, it makes it so I can't access the buttons that I need to push to continue the webinar, okay? So I ask that you be careful with how long you write those questions. If they are too long, I may just tell you, I can't, I can't answer, <laughs> it's too long for me to answer, okay? All right, all right, so let's go ahead. We'll go ahead and get started here. All right, hello JT, let's see, hi doc. My Genix immunoblot was technically negative, but it has several indeterminate bands. I'm considering doing 21 days of a provocative antibiotics using flagell and azithromycin, and then retesting with the immunoblot. Um, do you feel this is a good approach? And then secondly, outside of the labs, are there one or two major things you found that help you differentiate mold from Lyme uh, symptom-wise. Okay, so let me let me talk about the second part there. Um, so Lyme disease and mold toxicity syndrome can look the same. They they look very much identical, and there is not one distinguishing symptom, unfortunately. Okay, and so here's why. So. When you have Lyme, one of the big reasons that you feel poorly is that your immune system and trying to get rid of the germ, over your white blood cells uh, produce a group of chemicals called cytokines. And those of you who've been here before know I talk about cytokines a lot, okay? So cytokines are chemicals that are good and bad. On the good side, when white blood cells make cytokines, it helps turn the immune system on by causing more white blood cells to be made those white blood cells get drawn to where the infection is or the toxin is, and they help those white blood cells deal better with dealing with that infection or toxin, okay? That's all good. The problem is, is that when the immune system is having a hard time dealing with something like mold toxins in you or like Lyme germs in you, the immune system will keep trying harder and harder and eventually it makes too many cytokines. And when you get too many cytokines, that can lead to various symptoms, including difficult thinking, um, bad fatigue, muscle pain, neuro um, neurologic dysfunction, so you get neuropathies, um, interference with how your hormones work, so you can have thyroid and adrenal issues, for instance. And so what the symptoms look like, a fatigue, hurt all over, can't think, those kind of symptoms, and bad insomnia, they're all triggered by cytokines, all right? So Lyme triggers too many cytokines, and having mold toxins build up in you trigger too many cytokines. So they can look all the same, basically. 
So the only way that I have found to do any distinguishing factors that kind of give me a clue that it might be more mold toxicity is the problem rather than Lyme is in taking a detailed history. Sometimes through the history that I get about how somebody got sick and when they got sick gives me enough clues to figure out, well, maybe it's more of a mold toxin problem, for instance. Okay, so for instance, I've got a, a patient of mine that had a um, terrible, terrible thinking problem, really bad thinking problems. And his previous Lyme doctor had done Lyme testing and found he had Lyme. Um, and also that he, she thought he might have Bartonella because Bartonella can get bad thinking problems too. So, but she had recommended that he start IV antibiotics right away. And if he didn't, his, he was going to ruin his brain. I mean, those were the words that she had used, something along those lines. So he came to see me for a second opinion. And when I was talking with, I mean, this is a guy that literally had been high functioning, uh, coaching teams, running a financial company. I mean, really, really high functioning. And about four years prior to seeing me, he had basically lost his whole life. He um, got very fatigued, could not think anymore, started hurting all over. Eventually his wife took his kids and left and he had nothing. He lost his job. I mean, he was really down and out. But when I, I asked him what was going on around that time that he got sick and I, and I really pressed him on it, what I discovered is he had just move, moved into a new house within like a, maybe a month of when he first got sick. And, and then when I pressed him on it even more, he was able to say that there had been mold in that house, okay? So for him, it was very clear to me, it's probably mold that exposures and mold toxins, not necessarily Lyme. There was a clear place in his history that said mold exposures led to health decline, okay? So that was very clear. Um, so we did, we tested him. He came back loaded with mold toxins. I spent three months detoxing him and he got his whole life back, um, got his job back. Um, it was back thriving and functioning as an active member of his community. And in his case, I never even treated his Lyme disease uh, because in the end, even though he tested positive for Lyme, I think his immune system had dealt with it and we didn't even need to treat the Lyme infection because it would either been knocked out by his immune system or the immune system was keeping it under control. Okay, so that's so I use a history number one. Okay, now other times I will choose to look for mold toxin illness is if I've got somebody I've been treating for Lyme and they don't have a clear history of mold exposures, but I'm treating them and say I'm six to nine months into treatment and nothing I do is helping them budge forward. Then I'm going to start looking for other things that trigger cytokines. All right, and one of those is mold toxins. In that kind of a situation, I would do a urine test for mold toxins, and I would use either a Great Plains lab or I would use something called real-time lab um, to go ahead and check and see, are there excess mold toxins in the urine? Okay, all right. So that, that's how we answer that question, okay? Now, finally, one other quick thing. For people that aren't familiar with mold toxin illness, let me just talk briefly about what happens with that. So we think that there are 25% of people that have a genetic susceptibility or genetic programming error that may make it so they can develop mold toxin illness. In particular, what we know happens is in 75% of us, if we breathe in a mold toxin from the world around us, it gets absorbed into our bloodstream and our immune system sees it, tags it for removal, and then other immune cells come in and break down those mold toxins, okay? All right, that's what happens in 75% uh, of people. In 25% of people with this genetic programming error, what happens is those mold toxins do not get tagged to be broken down, and they don't get broken down. They go to the liver, and the liver is supposed to change them into a water-based toxin that would then get mixed in our poop and pooped out, well, the liver can't transform them. The liver just sends them out to the intestines as a fat toxin. And as a fat toxin, they get reabsorbed right back into the bloodstream before they get pooped out. So you get this endless loop of toxins going to the liver, going to the intestines, back into the blood. It just keeps looping and looping and keeps triggering cytokines that make somebody feel really sick. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Back to the first part of your question. All right. So what JT is talking about is when, all right, so when we're doing um, a Western blot or an immunoblot, both of those two tests through Igenix are techniques that are used to see, is your immune system manufacturing antibodies that attach to proteins that are found in the covering of the Lyme germ? Okay, 
there, and there's a Western blot that can do that. And there's this test called an immunoblot that can do that. Now there's other differences in the immunoblot and the Western blot, but the, the central thing that they both look for is, do you manufacture antibodies that attach to the germ? Okay. Now in Lyme disease, one of the things that can happen that make it hard to get a positive immunoblot or Western blot is the immune system may not be able to see the germ to manufacture those antibodies, to even know the germ is there, all right? So Lyme is masterful at surviving in us. And one of the things it does is it hides way out of the blood system, way out of blood flow in tissues that don't have good blood flow. And the reason it hides is oxygen that is found in blood can be toxic to Lyme, it can kill Lyme. So Lyme is designed to survive, okay? The trouble is when it hides in all these tissues that don't have good blood flow, like in your joints and on your nerve coverings in your brain, um, when it hides on all these tissues, the immune system has a hard time seeing it. Okay, so what you can do is you can use antibiotics to kill the germ for about three weeks to four weeks and then go test for it. And what happens is while you're killing the germ with the antibiotics, um, the tissues where these germs are located don't like holding on to dead bug parts. And they, re they, they, they release these Lyme parts, the proteins and toxins into the bloodstream where guess what has a better chance of seeing it? The immune system does, okay? So the immune system can make uh, a, have a stronger reaction and therefore will start showing signs on the Western blot or immunoblot, right? That's the idea behind it. So it seems like a reasonable approach, JT. Okay, all right. Thanks for that question and uh, good luck to you. All right, let's see here. All right, hello, Remy. Bear with me, everyone. I'm just trying to make sure Hello, Remy, let's see. I have a kind of blood reaction after I eat. It makes me pain inside of muscles and I feel my blood pressure everywhere. I hear it strongly in my ears. It's getting worse when I lay down. I also have air hunger in the night, heart racing and constant muscle pain. Could it be Babesia? It started after a new tick bite two years ago I followed your treatment for Borrelia, but these symptoms didn't go away. Can Bezia stay long in the body? I don't find uh, anything on, let's see, on that in research. Can I take artemisin with glutathione and CoQ10, which are antioxidants? Thanks for the great job you're doing. Remy from France. Hold on here a minute, Remy. I wanna look back through this question again. Okay, so Remy, um, let me just talk about the air hunger uh, part of things. So first of all, the, the initial symptoms you talk about, about um, you, that you feel um, pain inside of muscles and blood pressure everywhere, and you hear it in your ears. I, I'm not quite sure if that relates to Babesia or not. I wouldn't think of those as Babesia symptoms. Those might be related more to Lyme and uh, Lyme disease, okay? Um, in terms of what Babesia symptoms are, Babesia is known for doing a number of symptoms. One is Babesia can give you air hunger, okay? Um, and so it can give you a uh, feeling like you can't get enough air in even when you're at rest, when you're doing resting activities, for instance. The other thing it can give you is um, a night sweats or sweating at nighttime. It can also, uh, and those could be drenching spots. I mean, it could be so heavy that you actually soak the bed, for instance, okay? Um, the other thing that it can do is it can give people a lot of headaches in the front of the head. So you can have frontal headaches. It can cause some imbalance in uh, what's known as the vagal nervous system or the vasovagal system, which can result in you having adrenaline surges periodically where you get um, racing and skipping of the heart 
and they can be followed with adrenaline plunges where you get have a hard time maintaining blood pressure and you can get lightheaded um, quite easily, for instance, too, okay? Um, so, and then finally, Babesia, a um, couple other things. Babesia can give you a bunch of little cherry red spots that form underneath the skin. And then finally, um, a, a kind of a peculiar symptom with Babesia, Babesia um, can give people a deja vu experiences, okay? So in the deja vu experiences, um, what I mean by that is people will have deja vu. They'll have very frequent deja vu, like even once a day, maybe uh, maybe two or three times a week, much more in excess than most of us would have deja vu symptoms, okay? So with what you've told me here, I don't know if what you're having is Babesia, but if you have a number of the symptoms that I just talked about, then it is time to think about it could be Babesia. Now, can Babesia stay in the body for a long time? Yeah, Babesia can be there for a long time. It can be there for years sometimes and be causing people problems or perhaps the immune system will keep it under control for a while. And then suddenly because of stress or something else that goes on in a person's life, uh, the immune system loses the ability to keep that, those Babesia germs under control. Okay, all right. So yeah, it, it could uh, Babesia could give you some of these symptoms, okay? Um, could you take artemisinin with glutathione and CoQ10? So artemisinin, everyone, is a an herb that comes to us um, from China. It's also known as Chinese wormwood. It is an herb that we can use to treat for Babesia. Um, can it be taken with glutathione and CoQ10? Yeah, I have no problem using it with those. Um, yeah, anyhow, that's, that's what I have for you there. Okay, thanks, Remy. Good luck to you. Hello, Megan. Let's see. An individual with Lyme and Bart and excess yeast overgrowth may have an exacerbation of their Lyme symptoms due to a yeast problem, as you've explained. But someone who does not have a Lyme infection but has a yeast infection will definitely not present with a sudden onset of Lyme symptoms such as muscle fasciculations, joint pain, neuralgia, paresthesias, etc., but rather have the typical array of yeast overgrowth symptoms. So is that that the excess cytokine and toxic byproducts of yeast have this differing effect in someone with Bart and Lyme infection because their nerve and joint issues already have a higher baseline of inflammation? In other words, do the yeast-induced cytokines migrate to those areas in the body that are already vulnerable and damaged with someone like in Lyme and Bart, in addition to causing the classic yeast overgrowth symptoms? So the answer is kind of yes. Um, so when, so again, as, as I mentioned earlier tonight at the beginning of the webinar, when somebody has Lyme disease, the major one of the major reasons they feel poorly is that their immune system overproduces cytokines, okay? And those cytokines get in the bloodstream and go out throughout the body and give inflammation, give fatigue, uh, cause insomnia, can give brain dysfunction, all right? That's all because of the excess cytokines. Now, if you have too many yeast in your intestines, um, those yeast grow there and, and some of the symptoms they can give are gassiness and bloating. They can cause sugar cravings, okay? But the other thing that they give is they trigger the immune system to overproduce cytokines. And those cytokines that are um, being triggered by yeast in the intestines get into the bloodstream and they go throughout, uh, throughout the body and they can cause inflammation throughout the body, okay? In addition, if you tend to have neurologic symptoms that are related to Lyme and to, um, um, to um, uh, Bartonella, for instance, one of the things that can happen when you have too many yeast is yeast, when you have too many, uh, trigger the production or make, actually no, don't trigger, they make um, uh, um, um, toxins and those toxins can get absorbed into the bloodstream and they have a neurologic toxic effect. So sometimes that increased neur neurologic symptoms you get when somebody has yeast could be because of the neurotoxins that the yeast produce in addition to the cytokines uh, that they are releasing as well too, okay? All right, so that's kind of, how, that's how I like to look at it. One other word about those yeast toxins is when those yeast toxins get absorbed into the bloodstream um, they can go and interact with the skin 
And in the skin, they seem to exacerbate or make it easier to get various kinds of skin rashes like eczema. Um, sometimes um, they can result in um, more pimples and acne, for instance. So those are signs that somebody could be having too many yeast too, okay? So the big way of distinguishing if you have yeast as part of this is if you have a lot of gassiness and bloating, if you have, uh, if you're a woman, you have repeated vaginal yeast infections, if you have marked sugar cravings, and if you get into some of those skin changes I was just telling you about, then those are times to start thinking about yeast. The other times to think about yeast are if you have a, you're doing fairly well with your Lyme and Bart, you've been treating it with antibiotics, and then suddenly everything goes into a big decline. Um, while you're on those antibiotics, think yeast, um, because being on the antibiotics, either herbal or prescription, is a perfect setup for yeast moving in. And once those yeast move into the intestines too much or grow too much in the intestines, they can trigger a huge surge in cytokines, which make all of your symptoms look worse, okay? And then finally, the last time I think about yeast is if I've got somebody that's in remission and then they suddenly come out of remission, the first thing I want to make sure is that they don't have a bunch of symptoms suggesting yeast. So they can, this could be even a year or two after they've been in remission and they've been off of antibiotics. Yeast can still set up in the intestines during that time period. And the reason is, is once you're on antibiotics, even for a month or a week, short periods of time, you're a setup for having changes in the good bacteria that live in the uh, intestines. And those and there's been some studies done that I've looked at that even show that those changes in the good bacteria can go on for years. And because you have an alteration in the good bacteria in the intestines, and if that has gone on for years, it can sometimes then take, um, it can sometimes leave you a setup for too many yeast that live in the intestines growing too much, okay? All right, all right. Thanks for the question, Megan. Let me do a quick screen share here for a minute, actually. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna go to the my Lyme disease information site. So this is Treat Lyme by Marty Ross MD. Okay. And take a look up here in my online Lyme guide. And there is a chapter called Yeast. Let me try that again here. It's showing up. I, I clean. I got to change the view that it's given you here. All right. So this is my yeast chapter. If you're wondering how do you figure out if you have yeast, I have written a whole article about it. Okay. And if you have too many yeast, if you're wondering ways that I suggest to kill it, read this article here. Okay. All right. Let's see here. All right. Megan, thank you for that question. Good luck to you. Hello, Cara. Kara or Cara, I'm sorry. I obviously can't tell from that spelling. Um, hi, Dr. Ross. For people allergic to shrimp, should they stay away from glucosamine sulfate? Two, for dry eyes, have you found hyaluronic acid effective? And three, can you tell if a patient has persister Lyme or the active form? All right, we'll work backwards because <laughs> I have more confidence in my first response than I do in the second and third one, okay? So for question number three, can you tell if a patient has persistent Lyme or active form? The answer is no. There's, there's no. There is no test to tell us whether somebody has persister or active Lyme going on, okay? Now, I, I'm, so let me talk about persisters first. Okay, so everyone, the world of Lyme is changing and there's been a lot of research going on looking at the idea that one of the reasons people with Lyme are not getting better, those that can't get better, one of the reasons may be that their Lyme germs, some of them um, have turned into what are called persister forms or a, per, or a persister state, okay? So many of you may know that traditionally we've all we've always thought that Lyme lives in you in two major forms. One is called the spirochete. That's the corkscrew looking thing. You've probably seen pictures of that on the internet. And then the other form that it lives in are microscopic cyst forms of the germ. 
okay? So it lives in those two states. I'm, I'm sorry, forms. All right, now, some of the spirochetes and some of the cysts can take on a persister state or persister form. And essentially what happens is those germs, um, when they've been exposed to antibiotics for a while, um, go into hibernation. They just slow their metabolism way down and they start ignoring the antibiotics that we throw at them. Now, most of the traditional antibiotics that we use for Lyme and for Bartonella, for instance, because Bartonella can evidently design, um, develop persister forms too. Most of the antibiotics we use are designed to treat growing forms of the germ as opposed to treating the persister forms, okay? So a lot of us now, as we design our treatments, are starting to think, what do we do to deal with both the growing forms and the persister forms? And one of the drugs that has come out that were many of us are starting to use based on research um, that came out about two years, about a year and a half ago now at Stanford, and then subsequent case reports about one of our colleagues using this on his patients. We're using a drug that is used to treat uh, alcoholics called antabuse or disulfiram to treat persisters, okay? Other drugs that we're using to treat persisters include something called Dapsone, uh, which is a, a medicine that had previously been used for leprosy. And, and then based on laboratory experiments, I'm also using oregano oil and laboratory experiments would suggest something called methylene blue might be effective at treating these persister forms too. I, at times, am just design, using treatments that just treat for persisters and that's using the uh, disulfiram to do that. But more and more, I'm starting to design treatments that treat for both active as well as persister forms at the same time. Um, it's unclear to me from research if the disulfiram that many of my colleagues are using as the only agent um, actually treat growing forms of the germ. We know from lab experiments, they treat the persister forms, but the lab experiments that I've been able to find do not look at whether they treat the growing forms of those germs, okay? So I'm not sure if they work. So more and more, I'm starting to combine it with um, the normal kind of the antibiotics we might use for rifampin and Lyme, and in addition, adding disulfiram to that, for instance, or if I don't use disulfiram, using methylene blue or using oregano oil as examples, okay? All right. All right, so let's see, second part of your question. So hyaluronic acid in the form of a drop can help hold moisture in the eye. Yeah, I have seen that to be effective, okay? All right, and number one, um, for people allergic to shrimp, should they stay away from glucosamine sulfate? Good question, I don't know. Um, I would have to look that up. I'd have to look into the literature on that, and I don't know that one off the top of my head, okay? All right, thanks for, thanks for that question. Good luck to you, Kara. Let's see here. All right. Hold on here a minute, everyone. I just need to see something a little closer here. Okay. All right. Hi, Emily. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thank you for these webinars. You're welcome. Let's see. I have some quick questions. Can Lyme disease cause permanent numbness and nerve damage? Two years ago, I had gotten a sports injury resulting in part of my ankle going numb. The cause of this was an accidental kick from a classmate. If this is Lyme related, would you recommend to help? Uh, what would you recommend to help nerve restoration? Thanks. So um, when you have trauma, like a kick to the ankle, it could have been that they literally kicked and damaged the nerve, okay? In that kind of a situation, we often will see that nerves will heal, but it can take about um, uh, one year total time from the injury before we see healing of those nerves. That would be healing on its own, okay, all right? Now, Lyme disease also through, you know, non-trauma mechanisms can injure nerves as well too. And that injury is often related to inflammation of the nerve. And also there's something else that happens in that when you have, um, when you have Lyme and you have chronic infection, one of the immune system's responses to getting rid of those germs, in addition to making cytokines that you hear me talk about all the time, um, the immune cells can, uh, some of the immune cells will make um, hydrogen peroxide um, and you'll have ozone produced. And these chemicals are oxidizing agents that are designed to kill germs. But 
Um, they also damage fat membranes or fatty tissues or fat coverings. Your every one of our cell membranes are made up of a double layer of fat. And so the cell membranes can get injured as well too. Also, those oxidizing agents can damage the energy factories that live in our cells called mitochondria. So when I've got somebody with neuropathy with Lyme and Bartonella, because Bartonella can do the same similar thing, one of the things I'd like to do is to try to treat their infections for about two to four months, see if some of that neuropathy is gonna get better just by treating the infection and just by doing something to get inflammation down. And so what I would use to get inflammation down, I'd like using curcumin. I think many of you know, that's what I like using to treat the kind of inflammation that we see in Lyme and in Bartonella. Curcumin is a component of turmeric. Um, it is um, uh, not that well absorbed. So we have to have it prepared in special preparations. And the preparation that I like to use is, um, I like to have it made uh, as liposomal curcumin, meaning it's microscopically wrapped in fat, okay? And so the product I use is a product by Thorne called Bariva 500, uh, one pill, three times a day. And that could be a useful inflammation, inflammatory, okay? The other things though that you wanna do though, is you wanna repair the cell membrane and, and you wanna repair the mitochondria. And so the other parts that I like to do are to have somebody on phospholipid repair um, and I will usually add that if we're like four months into treatment and getting the infection out and treating inflammation doesn't work, then at around four months uh, to six months, I might start doing things to repair that cell membrane damage and the mitochondria injury too. And I like to do that by giving the fats that make up those membranes. And a product that I like to use that does that is ATP 360 by Research Nutritionals, three pills one time a day. Okay. The other thing I like to do is to get people on glutathione. Glutathione is a very powerful antioxidant that is manufactured in every one of our cells and its purpose is to repair damage and injury. All right. But one of the things that can happen when you've got nerve injury is your cells may deplete their glutathione gas tank. Okay. So you need to fill it back up. And I like doing that by using liposomal glutathione. Okay. And the, uh, the way that you would do that is there's a product manufactured by a company called Research Nutritionals um, that has track record of science showing great absorption of glutathione. And that is to, uh, our great absorption of the way they prepare glutathione. And they have a liposomal variety of glutathione. And that product is called Trifortify. And I like to use it as 500 or 450 milligrams, which is one teaspoon uh, one time a day, sometimes one teaspoon twice a day, okay? So my nerve repair formula would be be on an anti-inflammatory like curcumin, the, th the Thorn Mariva 500, one pill three times a day, repair the cell membrane covering and the mitochondria membrane covering using that ATP 360 as um, three pills one time a day. And then also get on liposomal glutathione, the Trifortify, and I like people to take one teaspoon once or twice a day, okay? All right, so those are the things that you would um, would do for that, okay? All right, and then um, let's see. Oh, one more thing. That ATP 360 has coenzyme Q10 in it. And if you're treating Babesia at the same time and you're using either atovaquone um, or uh, atovaquone proquinel, so atovaquone is also known as Mepron, Atovaquone proquinel is known as malarone. If you're using either one of those, you do not want to be on CoQ10 because CoQ10 will interfere with how that atovaquone works, okay? So in that situation, there's another research nutritionals product you could use that does not have the CoQ10 in it, and that's a product called NT Factor, and you would want to take it as two pills three times a day, okay? All right. Thanks for that question, Emily. Good luck to you. Just, I'm going to do a quick screen share here again. All right. Okay, so I'm back in uh, Treatline by Marty Ross, MD. 
And if you want to see more details about what I was just talking about, take a look at my chapter called Brain and Nerves. And in the Brain and Nerves chapter, you can find this article that I've written called Lyme Disease uh, or Neuropathy Repair, Heal That Tingling, Numbness, and Pain. Okay. All right. All right. Let me go back here. All right. All right. Good luck to you. Hello, Brittany. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. Are there any herbs you recommend during breastfeeding rather than taking antibiotics? I have been on amoxicillin and azithromycin for the past 16 months during my pregnancy and up to now breastfeeding. However, I believe they are messing with my seven-month-old daughter. She has been healthy and had no issues up until this past Saturday when she began breaking out in hives, and I'm afraid she may be experiencing uh, mast cell activation syndrome or dermatographia. Or could this be a sign of Lyme showing in her? Cord blood was negative for Lyme and co-infections. Um, so hives, I have not seen hives in babies be the indication that they have Lyme. I, I just want to say, I, I doubt from, you know, at least from what you wrote here, I, I would obviously want to ask a bunch of questions to make sure there isn't anything else clinically going on that could suggest Lyme. But just based on this, I, I don't think that's an indicator of Lyme. Could it be that your baby is having some reaction to the chemicals that you, she's getting through your breast milk? It is possible. Um, it is possible that those hives could be part of an allergic reaction. Hives also can be triggered by various virus infections. So maybe there's something else going on with her as well too. When it comes to during pregnancy, and I know you're talking after pregnancy, but during pregnancy, the, um, we do not have safety studies on herbs to know if they are safe to use during pregnancy when you have a baby inside you, okay? After pregnancy, during breastfeeding, I have even started children in their like months old, six months old and beyond. I have treated their Lyme with Otoba and Cat's Claw and have not found any problems happen with doing that, okay? Um, is it if you're trying to use the herbs as a means of preventing breast milk transmission, I think it would be okay to use an Otoba and a cat's claw for Lyme. Um, and I think there's a possibility that would that would work for you too. Okay. In terms of how you use them, I would use them the same way you would if you were not breastfeeding. And let me show you an article you can take a look at. So Otoba and Cat's Claw, everyone, are my favorite two herbal. Uh, Lyme antibiotics. Um, and I started using them uh, years ago based on um, a published study that came to us uh, from Dr. Eva Shapi uh, out of her Lyme disease research lab in New Haven, Connecticut. And what she was able to show is that um, these two herbs together do a whopping kill of both spirochete and cyst-Lyme. And when you put them together, they wipe out 100% of Lyme biofilm. So I started using them um, a number, probably about, oh gosh, probably seven or eight years ago now. And I find that they work effectively against Lyme uh, clinically. I see clinical improvement about 90% of the time. So I really like these two. And um, you can find more information about them here in this article um, called uh, Otoba Bark uh, Extract and cat's claw tinctures, okay? Describes the science of Dr. Choppy, and it also tells you how to use them too, all right? Okay, good luck to you, Brittany. Hello, JT. Do you find heart arrhythmia like atrial fib is more common in mold or Lyme? Um, 
I would say it's more common in Lyme. I'm not aware of, um, and in my experience, what I've seen, nor am I aware from any published studies that mold toxicity leads to cardiac arrhythmias um, or heart beating abnormalities. Um, Lyme does have that kind of track record of doing that. So I'd say they're probably more common in Lyme. Okay, all right. Thanks for the question. Hello, Clara. Let's see. Constant dizziness never goes away. Very bad at times. It's been three years. Is this related to Lyme? So, Clara, I would need to ask you more questions to know in your situation, is it related to Lyme? Because I would want to know more about other symptoms you have in addition to the dizziness. And I would also need to clarify what is the quality of that dizziness. So dizziness uh, to some people means they feel lightheaded or cloudy. To other, another way that dizziness can show up is it gives you a, 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 a merry-go-round kind of feeling or a spinning kind of quality. And uh, they both can have different meanings, okay? So the lightheaded cloudy can happen in Lyme and in Bartonella. The uh, kind of spinning kind of dizziness usually means there's some injury to the inner ear um, or it could be injury of a part of the back of your brain called the cerebellum. Um, and um, there's certain neurologic testing you can do to figure out if that's what's going on. Those could also be related to Lyme and Bartonella as well too, okay? So it's possible. But to say whether you have Lyme or Bartonella, I would need a lot more information. Okay, thanks for the question. Hello, Naomi. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Is it possible that a low CD57 count, which can be associated with chronic Lyme disease, could also be associated with an illness like MS? As I have read that non-infectious immune diseases may also be associated with low CD, CD57 count. Um, so, Naomi, I haven't seen that relationship before, I'm not, so I don't know. I, I haven't seen literature on that. Um, I do acknowledge, based upon my reading of CD57, though, is that there are other viruses that can cause it to be low, like people with HIV and AIDS can sometimes have low CD57. And I, I, I postulate, therefore, that other viruses um, might also cause it to be low. So CD57, everyone, is a type of white blood cell that um, a very specific kind, not all white blood cells, but a very specific kind of white blood cell that we will see about 80% of the time that it is low in people with chronic active Lyme disease, all right? It is not diagnostic for Lyme, and the reason it's not diagnostic is there may be other things that trigger it to be on the low side as well too. But when you see that it is low and there is enough other things going on and laboratory testing that supports it, it can become part of the Lyme disease puzzle or helping you make a decision as to whether somebody has Lyme disease uh, based on their symptoms, okay? All right. Um, but yeah, so and is it in uh, MS? I'm, I'm not quite sure. If it would it could be if they have M Lyme caused or MS caused by Lyme, that's possible. Okay. Thanks for that question. Good luck to you. Hello, Mark. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. Um, hold on here just a minute. Hello, Dr. Ross. Thank you for these webinars. My wife has severe mold toxicity, but is sensitive to medicines, herbals, and supplements. Does it matter the condition when a person is sensitive and how uh, you can tell that a person is sensitive to medications, herbals, and supplements when explaining to other people, or other doctors, what to look out for. I read somewhere, which I can't find, has something to do with MTHFR and violent reactions, but could you please explain how to determine sensitive patients 
And is this an emerging field for uh, how long now? Thank you, Mark. Let me, let me read back to this again. Hello, Dr. Ross. Thank you for these webinars. My wife has severe mold toxicity, which is sensitive to medicines, herbals, and supplements. Does it matter the con does it matter the condition when a person is sensitive? And how can you tell that a person is sensitive to medications, herbals, and supplements when explaining to other people or other doctors what to look out for? Um, all right. So there are there is a subset of people that I treat in Lyme disease and also in mold toxicity syndrome that are sensitive to the things that we give them, whether they're herbal medicines or prescription medicines. And what I mean by that sensitive is one thing is they might have stronger um, side effect reactions. They might have very strong Herxheimer reactions, meaning that they get, a. Um, so everyone is, you know, Herxheimer, or what, to explain Herxheimer, Herxheimer is a reaction that occurs when you kill germs or when you start moving mold toxins out of the body. Well, actually, let's let's rephrase that. People can have cytokine surges, which when we're in, in treating Lyme, a cytokine surge is something we call a Herxheimer reaction, which is as we kill germs, the immune system is going to produce more cytokines, and those cytokines may make all of their symptoms worse. Okay, all right. In mold toxicity, what happens when we start moving mold toxins out of a person, it can sometimes trigger an increased amount of cytokines as well. But because it's not related to killing germs, we don't technically call that a Herxheimer reaction, but we describe it as a cytokine surge, okay? So keep in mind that um, basically when somebody has mold or Lyme, they feel badly because they're already overproducing too many cytokines and too many cytokines make it so you can't think, make you hurt all over, can give you lots of confusion, um, interfere with how your hormonal systems work, et cetera. And if you start moving toxins out too fast in a person, then that might trigger even a severe worsening of that reaction as well too, okay? Now, in somebody that is sensitive, it's not always clear why they are more sensitive, but many of us hypothesize and believe it has to do with detox systems in the body um, not functioning correctly to be able to remove a substance, all right? So drug levels, the thing, um, what determines how a medicine is going to work is ultimately how much can we build up in the blood, all right? And that's determined by how much do you take and how quickly your detox systems can remove it, all right? So if you've got somebody with impaired detox over here, their ability for their liver or their kidneys to remove things, you don't need to give them as much over here to get a, an adequate blood level of it, okay? So if I am working an and, we do not have reliable testing that shows that somebody is going to be medically sensitive. So we do have the ability to see if a person has genetic predispositions to having problems detoxifying, okay? And those would be things like um, MTHFR, some of you have heard about before, and um, measuring what we call genetic SNPs to see if they have defects in other detoxifying mechanisms, all right? But those genetic profiles that we get only tell us that a person has a genetic predisposition to the problem. It doesn't prove they actually have the problem, all right? And that's and so just be aware of that, okay? So those genetic SNPs do not prove you have a sensitivity or detox problem, all right? So we don't have a way of really testing to see if a person is sensitive. The only way we really can know if a person is sensitive is see what happens. And if that person has a history of over of reacting strongly, either with side effects or cytokine surge symptoms, we can assume that they are a person that is going to be sensitive to other things that we give them. And we should go more slowly um, and uh, with what we do, and we should start at extremely low doses, okay? So there isn't a test, rather it's the good. It's a good do job that doctors should do, and that is ask a person, how do you react to medicines? How do you react to exposures to chemicals in the world around you? Is, and so we need to look and see, are there any clues we get that this person is somebody that's gonna have a hard time handling things we give them, or things that they breathe in from the world around them, or things that go on their skin, okay? That's how we figure it out. We have to get a detailed history to figure it out.
okay? And again, those sensitivities can be either side effects or the super sensitive person is somebody that doesn't need to get as much chemical in their blood because they don't remove it easily. Therefore, even small amounts can build up high levels of those chemicals in their blood, triggering possible cytokine excess as well. Okay. All right. Um, anyhow, I hope that answers your question, Mark. Hello, Geraldine. Let's see. When you have Lyme symptoms such as neck, jaw, back pain, is it the effect of the bacteria going about their lives or can it be a sign that they are being killed? So again, kind of, Geraldine, the point I've been trying to raise tonight is that Lyme symptoms are actually due to the immune system reaction against the germ. And that is the immune system overproduces those chemicals called cytokines, okay? So I described that a number of times tonight, but I'm gonna show you an article if you wanna read about it a little bit more. Let me do a screen share here. Okay, so take a look. I have a, a, a section in my online Lyme guide here. This is called Herxheimer and Cytokines. Take a look at this article called Control Cytokines, a Guide to Fixed Lyme Symptoms and Immune System. I talk more about cytokines and I talk about steps you can take to lower those cytokines in this article. Okay. All right. Uh, good luck to you, Geraldine. Hello, Jen. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. I'm wondering if you could speak about the results that you and your colleagues are seeing with disulfiram treatment of Lyme and co-infections. Also, what do you think are the causes for disulfiram-induced neuropathy and what can be done to mitigate them? Thank you. All right. So disulfiram, everyone I mentioned earlier tonight, is the new one of the new wonder drugs, if you will, um, that we're starting to use to try to treat for uh, persister Lyme. And so disulfiram is a medicine that traditionally has been used to treat alcoholism. In alcoholism, it blocks an enzyme that helps clean out a byproduct of alcohol metabolism. And this chemical chemical is acetaldehyde, and it can build up in high amounts that make a person sick, either at severe abdominal pain, maybe sometimes bad headaches as well too. Okay, those are the primary ways that it shows up. We are not sure, we do not know the exact mechanism by which it works to treat Lyme persisters, but we do know from laboratory experiments published out of Stanford University about two years ago, um, out of a lab there, that they do have the ability to kill persister cells, okay? Um, and in that experiment, I recently reread that experiment, they did not look to see what it does against growing Lyme, just what it does against persister cells, okay? All right, so again, everyone, persister cells are forms of spirochetes and forms of cysts that go into hibernation, slow their metabolism way down to start ignoring antibiotics, all right? So with the um, disulfiram, again, we don't know for sure how it kills things. We do hypothesize, in addition to it killing things, we know from the lab it can kill things. We hypothesize that um, it also is great at breaking up biofilms. And as many of you are aware of with disulfiram, people that take it can get huge Herxheimer reactions. I mean, stronger than we see with any other antibiotic regimens we use. And one of the reasons we think that happens is these uh, the chemical structure, which involves disulfide bonds, have the ability to actually break apart biofilm, opening up and exposing the germs in the biofilm, including Lyme germs, to the immune system so the immune system can jump in and start killing these germs more effectively too, okay? All right. So you have a direct killing effect from disulfiram, exactly how it works, we don't know, but also disulfiram is a great biofilm buster, okay? 
all right? All right, now one of the potential side effects, there's two major side effect problems with disulfiram. In addition to you have to limit any or not take any kind of foods that might have alcohol of any variety in them. In addition to that, um, so that you don't get disulfiram reaction, you there is the possibility about 15, 20% of people can get depression, anxiety, or other psychiatric symptoms while they're on disulfiram. And the other major side effect they can get is uh, neuropathy. Now, with the neuropathy, generally the neuropathy will reverse when you stop the disulfiram. So it does not appear to be permanent damage. There are some people that hypothesize that the neuropathy from um, disulfiram is due to the fact that it chelates or binds uh, minerals, including copper. And if it binds copper, that may, can lead to the neuropathy in the nerves. They, they need copper, okay? So one of the ways to avoid that is to give something else that this disulfiram can bind instead of binding the copper, and that's to give zinc. And so what I like using is a preventive um, to prevent that, as well as to treat it if it should develop, is zinc picolonate. And the picolonate salt of zinc uh, it seems to be well absorbed. And it comes as a 30 milligram pill. It's made by Thorne. And I usually will do one or two of those one time a day, all right? In addition, I will use a multi-B complex to help support nerve function too. Um, and so it'd be a B complex is what I like to use. Um, now, um, so, the, so your question was what can be done to mitigate it is beyond zinc, zinc picolinate, a 30 milligram pill, one or two um, a day. And then also I would be on a multi B complex pill as well too. All right. Okay. And then in terms of what are we seeing success wise? So I'll just reflect um, what was presented in Boston at the ILADS meeting um, back at the end, uh, beginning of November, actually, in 2019. And then I'll make some comments about that too. So Dr. Ligner, um, uh, Ken Ligner, is a physician that first started using disulfiram with one of his patients who asked him to put it on based on those Stanford studies, okay? And he published a case report in May of 2019 where he talked about what he had seen. <coughs> Excuse me, just a minute, everyone. Um, where he talked about what he had seen in three people that he treated. And then subsequent, and that caught everyone's attention, okay? And then in November in Boston at the ILADS meeting, the International Lyme Associated Disease Society meeting, he presented his findings on 31 patients that he had been treating with, all right? So I'm gonna talk about his 31 patients. So with his 31 patients, he found, I believe it was five to six people um, he got into permanent remission, or he calls it extended remission, okay? There were five to six people, and the reason I'm saying five to six, I'm just, I'm not remembering exactly off the top of my head right now, okay? I haven't read the article in a while, but five or six people in that 31 had to stop because of side effects. They just couldn't tolerate the medication, all right? And then there was a group that was the middle group that got improvements, but didn't get all the way well. All right. And I would say that's kind of reflecting what I'm seeing in my practice right now. I see that maybe about 30% of people um, get some benefit by or get into remission by using the disulfiram. Um, and I'm seeing that there's various degrees of improvement. Um, now, I haven't used it long enough. Again, keep in mind, I just reopened my, my clinical practice in December. So I'm still you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out at doing this now for six months. Okay. So I've got a lot of people on it and I'm still not prepared to report on my own personal results, but I'm seeing something similar to what Dr. Liegner talks about in his practice. So this is not the magic bullet for everyone, but it can be helpful. Things I'm doing to try to see if I can move it along compared to Ligner. Ligner, again, was using it just as a standalone medicine. He was not using any other antibiotics with his patients. I have recently been adding other antibiotics into the regimen to treat growing Lyme, why the desulfiram does persister Lyme, okay? 
So um, I'll be glad to report back to you in the future. But I think at this point, I would say, yeah, about maybe 20, 30 percent. Yeah, I'm sorry, 25 to 30 percent um, gets um, uh, can get into remission in my practice using this medication. OK. All right. Thanks for that question, Jen. Hi, Dr. Ross. Hi, Mary. Um, let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Can chronic Bartonella cause um, consistent elevated liver enzymes in the young patient with no history of any other liver disease? With treatment, liver enzymes will decrease. What is your opinion in regard to someone with chronic tick-borne diseases receiving the HPV vaccine? Um, all right. So in terms of hepatitis, I have not seen a Bartonella Hepatitis, okay, hepatitis, let me stand back. Hepatitis means liver inflammation, okay? And elevated liver enzymes means liver inflammation. And we call liver inflammation hepatitis, okay? All right. There are a number of viruses that are known to do that. The viruses and, and anyone that has ongoing li elevated liver enzymes should be checked to see if they have one of these infections. And the big ones would be um, hepatitis B and hepatitis C, both can set up chronic infections that can lead to ongoing liver inflammation, okay? All right. I have seen a few, a few, like three, in my time of treating Lyme disease since 2004, three Lyme disease patients that um, we did, uh, that had elevated liver enzymes that caught, went up so severely that it caused me to stop their treatment um, while I tried to do things to support their liver and investigate why they had it, but ultimately I couldn't find a cause and I decided that it must be a Lyme related hepatitis. And I have seen that before. And so I decided I chose to treat their hepatitis by treating their Lyme with antibiotics and they got better. I have not seen Bartonella to cause hepatitis. I just haven't seen it occur clinically, but given what you describe, I would wonder if you've got some kind of a Bartonella hepatitis here too, all right? I don't know that that happens for sure. I haven't had that clinical experience in, in working with the patients that I work with, okay? All right, let's see here. The HPV vaccine. So I don't recommend the flu vaccine because I see too many people's Lyme get worse on it. Um, I do believe there are certain vaccines that because there could be greater benefit than harm you get with activating the Lyme that you should do. I'm not convinced that the risk of getting HPV vaccine outweighs the risk of having a decline from Lyme. And so generally, um, I am not recommending people get it. Now, I will tell you, I don't have enough people that have gotten it to see if there's universally a lot of people that get worse. In other words, my experience in working with the flu vaccine is greater. I have seen a lot of people get worse with the flu vaccine, okay? But I don't have that experience with the HPV vaccine, but I generally do try to steer people away from it, okay? All right. Thanks for your question, Mary. Hello, Naomi. Let's see, I've been diagnosed with Lyme and MS. My neurology doctor believes my symptoms are due to MS, as in his opinion, lesions on my brain are consistent with MS and not Lyme. My Lyme doctor is convinced I do not have MS and all symptoms are due to Lyme. So my question is, in your experience, how common are lesions on the brain in Lyme patients? And what are the differences, if any, in the lesions in MS patients? Um, so Naomi, okay, this is this is a confusing question. It's a confusing issue. Okay, I'll just start by saying that. All right, hold on, here's a minute. All right, so when we say that somebody has multiple sclerosis, what we're saying is they have certain neurologic findings, and that they have lesions in their brain corresponding to those findings. So they'll have, you know, loss of vision temporarily, maybe, maybe they'll have problems using their arms or their legs. And then we do an MRI and we look in their brain and we see these lesions and we say, aha, that's MS. Okay. 
Now, the problem with that though, as in most neurologic diagnosis, most neurologic diagnoses are what are known as syndromes. It means we don't know what the heck causes them. All that neurology diagnoses usually do is describe the condition. So if you have enough boxes checked off of symptoms and certain findings on labs, we call that the condition, but it doesn't say what caused the condition. It literally is just describing the floor plan, but it doesn't say um, what led to that floor plan happening, okay? All right, all right, so Lyme can be a cause of MS, all right? There may be many other causes of MS because we clearly don't know what causes all MS, but Lyme can be a cause of MS. So in my practice, the way I like to describe it is that somebody has Lyme causing multiple sclerosis or they have Lyme MS. That's how I describe it, okay? Now, yes, MS, the lesions in MS are the same that can occur in Lyme disease. So I would agree with your Lyme doctor on that, but I would use the word such that it is Lyme causing MS and therefore the person has MS and they have Lyme disease. But if you have Lyme present with MS, there's a great likelihood it could be the cause of the MS, okay? And I notice what I just said, I said it could be the cause because there are a bunch of other causes of MS too. And maybe you, maybe both of them, you got Lyme and you got something else triggering the MS in you, okay? All right, we have no way of knowing for sure. Okay, all right. Thanks for that question, Naomi. Hello, Naomi. Let's see. In your opinion, what is better to take, B12 injections or B12 supplements? My B12 level is 177. Okay. So it all depends. And what it depends on is whether you have the capability of absorbing B12 based on your stomach's ability to produce a chemical called intrinsic factor. All right. So our stomachs are supposed to make a chemical a protein called intrinsic factor that binds B12 and helps it get absorbed into the bloodstream. There are certain people that are not able to make that intrinsic factor, okay? And so you can measure it, you can see if you make intrinsic factor. And if you do make intrinsic factor, then you could take B12 pills and they're gonna get absorbed and you're gonna do fine, okay? now. If you don't make intrinsic factor, and that's the kind of situation where we might want to give injections to make sure the B12 gets in, but there is also an equally um, effective way of getting the B12 in, and that is to do put it under your tongue. And when you put things under the tongue and they dissolve there, it gets absorbed directly into the bloodstream through the blood vessels on your mouth. So you don't have to go through the intestinal tract at all, okay? All right. Thanks for the question, Naomi. Hi, Nancy. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Thanks for all you do. You're welcome. Let's see. I had asked several weeks ago about my continued Bartonella symptoms of joint rib pain scapular pain weeks ago. You had suggested I look into yeast, which I did, and it's not yeast. My LMD is prescribed injections of BPC-157 peptide, also thymosin B4 injections. I'm also on five different herbal products, including ABART, BLT, Cemento cocktail, and recently Cystis Icanthus. I first wanted to ask you what you think about the peptides. I have started the BPC-157. I think it is helping. I have been afraid to start the thymosin before because I had read some scary stuff about it promoting tumors. Can you please give me your opinion about both peptides in terms of their safety? Also, if you think they work, and do you recommend injecting BP-157 at pain sites or in the abdomen? Thank you. Um, and stay safe. Everyone stay safe. I agree with that. So Nancy, um, I 
I'm still trying to decide what I think about peptides. I haven't been using them in my practice. I know that Dr. Ken Holtorf, who is a Lyme disease and chronic fatigue specialist down in California, is a big promoter of using them in his practice, and he stands by them. He's using them to rebalance the immune system. And um, I still am skeptical that they work, but I haven't worked with them long enough to know. I know he claims good results, but the good res but he's also doing a ton of other things with patients at the same time. So it's hard to say if what he thinks is the cause is that the peptides are really doing it, or is it because he's doing tons of other things with patients at the same time. So um, I don't I don't have a, a, a solid opinion yet as to whether they work or don't work. Okay, all right. Thanks for that question. Hello, Shirley. Let's see. What is an alternative to cat's claw? Um, so um, cat's claw, okay, so everyone, cat's claw is an herb, as you know, that I like using to kill Lyme. And you can find it as part of Buner herbs. You can find it in the Rawls protocol. And you can find it in the Ross Lyme support protocol um, because it can be quite, quite effective. But I usually like to combine it with a second herbal antibiotic too. So um, so I would never use it alone, okay? So I usually like combining it with Otoba bark. Now, if I've got somebody that, it, uh, Otoba bark is also, brand name is known as Banderol by Nutramedics. Although you can find Wildcraft herbs that I use in my practice um, has a, a Bander or an Otoba bark product, it's just called Otoba bark, okay? All right. When I've got somebody that has cast claw sensitivities, what I often will do is instead use teasel root uh, alongside of the otoba. And the teasel root comes as a liquid tincture. And I would start it, I dose it the same identical way. And that is I work up to 30 drops of it twice a day in addition to taking the otoba bark. Okay. All right. Thanks for the question. Hello, Christine. Let's see, question. I have Lyme disease, Bartonella, and Epstein-Barr virus. I am having what I believe are the effects of acetylaldehyde from the time I wake up in the morning for several hours. I have brain fog, feel slightly drunk, and have anxiety. I don't drink alcohol. I also have ammonia. I can smell it in the sauna when I sweat. How do I resolve this? Um, okay, so number one, um, I would look... so. If you have too many yeast in your intestines, they can sometimes ferment and produce um, alcohol, okay? So one thing to look at is, do you have too many yeast in your intestines? Just to see, are you producing um, um, uh, alcohol, all right? And uh, you can take a look. I showed you earlier tonight the article I have about how do you diagnose yeast. If you don't remember that, look in my yeast chapter uh, yeast section in Treat Line by Marty Ross, MD, and look at a screening tool I have to see if you have yeast and figure out if you might have too many yeast from that, okay? And if you do, I would treat for too many yeast and see if that works. If it does not work, then what I would consider having you take, uh, it could be that your Lyme is producing toxins and that you are having a hard time removing them. Your body may be overwhelmed by those toxins. And so uh, if the liver is not able to move, process those toxins correctly, they will build up and we will start sweating them out. And we, as we sweat them out, we get that ammonia smell. Um, some of those toxins are also probably getting into your intestines. And then once they're in there, they're being reabsorbed back into your bloodstream too, all right? So a treatment you could do in addition um, to getting yeast out um, would be to start using binders and I would use um, probably a combination of activated charcoal and bentonite clay. Um, and I would take one pill of each one time a day. And after about a week, if that doesn't flare you up, I might increase to one pill of each twice a day. Realize when you take binders, they're called binders, all right? So you wanna make sure you're not taking anything else with them at the same time that could get bound up. 
So you want to take them, the way I have people take them is I have them stop all medicines and supplements beginning 30 minutes before they take them. And then they can resume their other medicines and supplements two hours after taking the binders. It is okay to eat at any time though, okay? All right, so that would be something for you to consider doing, okay? All right, uh, good luck to you, Christine. I don't know what happened there. When I hit a button <laughs> and I, I, I somehow logged myself out. And then um, now that I'm back in again, um, I have lost all of your questions. So if some of you had questions that I had not gotten to, please start writing them right away. We have about 10 more minutes here on um, the webinar. And if I see some questions here in the next few minutes, I will respond to those. I apologize. I don't even know it. I don't even know how that happened, but it did. Um, here we go. Here's one. I'll start taking them. All right. Hello, David. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. In regards to MS, have you read pathologist Alan McDonald's um, work findings on mic uh, microscoping filarial nematode worms in the brain tissue and central uh, cerebral spinal fluid of autopsy patients? who first presented with Lyme and developed MS. Very interesting findings as he performed many autopsies and also had brain donations for dissection from a brain bank. My main reasons for asking is, do you know of the effective anti-nematode antibiotics, which can cross the blood brain barrier and enter the spinal fluid? The answer is no, I don't. And, at the, and yes, I am aware of his work. I still am not um, convinced that the nematodes are causing illness though. All right, we, our bodies cohabitate with a lot of germs. I mean, if we look in our, we have tons of germs on our skin, tons and within our intestinal tract. There are numerous studies that show that we have all kinds of bacteria living inside of our cells. Just finding a germ there does not mean it is causing any problems, okay? So I, I, I have read that article with interest. I'm still not sure what the significance is of that, okay? All right. Thanks for that question, David. Good luck to you. Hi, Joey. So say hi, Dr. Ross. I have been on Siddha Akuta and Hutania for two months now, increasing each by one drop every other day. Now at 30 drops of each. Aside from, um, let's see, a couple days here and there with mild herxing, I don't feel much of anything. I don't feel bad, but not great either. Occasional burning pain in the bottom of feet and some noise in my head. I eat clean and stepped up my game the these past couple months. Eliminated sugar completely. What should be the next steps? How, how long be more on Siddha Okuda Hotania? Add anything. Also a few weeks back, someone mentioned Schomburg disease, I think that is what the dark skin around my ankles is from and related to Lyme. Can you speak to this? Thanks as ever for doing these webinars. So Joyce, I, I, um, I'm not sure what the next step is for you. The reason is I need, I need to know more about all of your symptoms because it could be you're not getting better because it's not Bartonella, it's something else going on, okay? Um, and so unfortunately, it would be hard for me to tell in this kind of a format. I will tell you though, that if the Otoba, I'm sorry, if the um, Hutania and Siddha Okuda are gonna work, um, usually by being at the full dose for two months 
is how long it takes before you know if you're going to have significant improvement for it all or not. So you may just need to treat a little bit longer if you're convinced you have Bartonella and maybe you just haven't used it long enough. In addition, if you are using it for Bartonella clinically, I find the Sita Akuda and Hutania to work effectively about um, 70 to 75% of the time. So it's possible they're just not working. All right. And that you may need to look at prescription antibiotics, which have a 85, I was 80 to 85% chance in Bartonella of working. Okay. In terms of Schomburg disease, I'm not familiar enough with it to talk about it right now. I would have to look up more about it. Okay. All right. Thanks for asking that question, Joyce, and good luck to you. Hi, Logan. Say hi, Doc. Do you tend to see flare-ups early on when treating Bartonella? Uh, currently taking rifampin, azithromycin, plaquenil. First two weeks had mood improvements. Previous th three to four weeks have been rather turbulent. Treating mainly BART on a clinical diagnosis. Thank you. Let's see here. Do you tend to have uh, early on when taking Bartonella? So I, I'm... Uh, I may be confused in how you're asking your question. Um, so when you say previous three to four weeks, do you mean the last three to four weeks before now, or do you mean three to four weeks before you started the rifampin, azithromycin, and Plaquenil? I can't tell from your question, okay? Um, the way that you wrote this, I can't tell. I would need to clarify that. Um, is it common that you might have more mood swings? Yes, as you start the, the uh, antibiotics. The other thing the antibiotics can do is they may trigger some more cytokines. It's possible you could have a little bit more fatigue, but it is true. I have seen people have more emotionality as they begin these uh, medications at times too. Okay, let's see. Anyhow, yeah, there you go. All right. Thanks for your question, Logan. Good luck. Diane says, what about shingles vaccine? So shingles vaccine for people that are 65 years of age and older, I do recommend. And the reason is, is that as we age, we get a greater, greater chance that we can have um, outbreaks of um, chicken pox, or we call that shingles. So when you're a kid and you get it for the first time, it's called chicken pox. And those viruses continue to live in you and live along our nerve pathways. And as we get older, they have a greater chance of coming down, crawling down those nerves and reinfecting our skin. The problem is, is when you get it as an older person, it can sometimes lead to chronic neurologic pain and become a severe illness. And I think the risk of having bad HPV, in my opinion, outweighs the risk that you might get worse when you have Lyme infection, okay? So I usually do recommend that one. So with any vaccine, ultimately you're weighing, when you have Lyme disease, you're weighing out risk and benefits. You're weighing out the risk of Lyme getting worse versus the risk of getting a terrible illness by, if you don't get the vaccine, okay? And you have to kind of consider them on a one-to-one -one basis. And usually those are the kind of discussions I like having one-on-one -on -one with a person, okay? Thanks for the question, Diane. Good luck. Let's see. All right. Hello, Eileen. Let's see. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for all of your help. I'm 71, diagnosed with Lyme five years ago probably had it at least 15 to 20 years before that. Can Lyme and Bartonella induce osteoporosis? I have not seen it do that, okay? So I don't think so. Um, let's see, about one year ago, Lyme and Bartonella pulled me backwards in an extreme bow from my lumbar vertebrae to the base of my skull every night while I slept. 
sometimes so severely that I woke up screaming in pain, seemed to get that under control. In January, I was diagnosed uh, osteoporosis and those same lumbar vertebrae where all the pain was. I'm currently on collagen and your protocol for yeast. I use a vibrator plate. I also still ride horses. What do you recommend? So, you know, in terms of the osteoporosis, again, I, I don't know, I have not seen a relationship between Lyme causing that and not, okay? Um, the things you can do for osteoporosis is you want to do strength training. Strength training can help support and build strong bones. Second thing, vitamin D. I like to get my vitamin D levels up in, in all people so that it's somewhere between 40 and 80, but vitamin D helps lead to more uh, calcium deposition within your bones, okay? And then um, I also like to have patients on calcium. <coughs> and you wanna be on about 1200 milligrams a day of calcium and you can divide that up three times a day, all right? The other thing I will do, if I do want to even have a greater chance of building strong bones, I like using a chemical that comes from um, um, soy. It's called Iproflavone. And what Iproflavone does is it limits the breakdown of bone so that, um, so that you don't lose calcium, basically, okay? And I'm not remembering the dosing off the top of my head. I have to go look it up. But the, the product is called Iproflavone, okay? All right. So that's my thoughts on that. Um, good luck to you, Eileen. Hello, Doug. I see. Are there developments on um, azelacillin that are worth mentioning? Thanks very much. All right. So azelacillin, everyone, is a penicillin that has been shown to treat persister and growing Lyme. And the person that has discovered that and is, has developed the science around that is um, Dr. Rahadas. Dr. Rahadas is the same scientist that discovered disulfiram can work, okay? So his lab out of Stanford University is doing some interesting work looking at agents that can treat persister Lyme. Now, azelacillin is a penicillin, it's a form of penicillin. And although it is FDA approved, there, uh, in other words, it's FDA approved to treat different conditions, there are no manufacturers of it. And um, Dr. Rahadis is evidently looking into becoming a manufacturer of that, developing a company to do it. But at this point, I have no idea when that's all going to take place. So beyond saying that, yep, it looks promising based on his, I think, mice experiments, actually, when I looked at it last. Um, but uh, a, a, we don't have human experiments yet to know if it will work. Mice experiments show that it shows promise. Um, I will tell you, uh, though, even what works in a mouse doesn't mean it will work in a human. So, for instance, Dr. Zhang's lab out of Johns Hopkins, who's another lab that's doing a lot of research on persister cells, sh uh, showed that a regimen um, on petri dishes and then in mice was quite effective at treating persister Lyme. That regimen was something called ceftriaxone, ceftriaxone, and doxycycline. And in mice experiments, wipe the germs out completely, all right? But those of us that have tried using it clinically just don't find it <laughs> to work that well in humans, all right? So keep that in mind too. It's, although it looks like it may have some promise, who knows? We'll have to find out when we start using it in humans, when we actually get it in a pill form, or if Dr. Rahadis or anyone else wants to do human experiments before they are able to start manufacturing it. Okay. All right. Thanks for that question, Doug. All right, everyone, that's it for me for tonight. I'm sorry about the uh, burp there towards the end with trying to, uh, I hit the wrong button and, and left the webinar room for a little bit. Um, so tomorrow morning somewhere, well, actually, it's going to be tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow early afternoon is when you're likely to get the email from me saying that the video is, is up so you can take a look at it. So it's going to be a bit later tomorrow. When you get that email, you'll be able to sign up also for next week's webinar. I am doing, actually, no, I'm taking next week off. I'm, I'm actually going to be I'm taking a week off next week. So the next webinar is two weeks from now, Okay. So, um, so, but you can sign up for that next webinar that is two weeks from now. Okay. All right, everyone. Um, 
I've had a good time being with you here tonight and uh, look forward to seeing you a couple of weeks. Good luck, everyone.